Welcome to Doctors at Work. My name is Matt Daniel and this podcast is about doctors' careers. It's part of my mission to help other doctors create successful and meaningful careers. Today we're talking about emotional intelligence and I'm having a conversation with Tracy Davies. And she tells me that emotional intelligence is about how we relate to ourselves and how we relate to others. The problem is that we have a tendency for when a certain event happens that straight away there is an emotion and sometimes we do things that we later regret. But the reality is that there's also a thought that occurs somewhere in between the emotion um, and the event and that thought is something that we often don't examine. So in order to be more emotionally intelligent, we need to slow down that link between an event and an emotion and an action and actually examine what thoughts are at play. And once we understand the thoughts and emotions at play, that allows us to choose actions based on the kind of person that we want to be. Better emotional intelligence will not only lead to happiness in ourselves, it will also improve our workplace relationships and interactions. Welcome, Tracy. Tell me about yourself. Well, thank you for inviting me to be on your podcast. Um, my name is Tracy Davis. I am a pathologist with subspecialty training in dermatopathology. I live in the United States in uh, Arizona, which is in the southwest portion of the country. And um, I'm a certified life coach as well. So currently, I am would, would be what I call mid-career pathologist. So I've worked in academic, private practice, and hospital settings for the last uh, 17 years. And in last year, made a big change and moved to the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, I'm also the author of a newsletter on LinkedIn called The Happy Physician. Thank you very much for joining me today, Tracy. And the topic for us today is emotional intelligence. What is emotional intelligence? Great question. I like to think of emotional intelligence as sort of like a superpower. It gives us this uh, opportunity to... Uh, recognize like stress triggers and respond in an appropriate manner. And, and to dive into that just a little bit deeper, it really shapes how we interact with both ourselves and with others. And I would say it can um, it can make our lives better. It really, I, I like to write about this topic and how it relates to making us happier, uh, both professionally and in our personal lives. Tell, tell me a little bit more then about what this means in practice. You said it's how we relate to ourselves or how we relate to the world around us. Maybe let's kind of start with the first one. Sort of what, what's emotional intelligence in relation to how we relate to ourselves? I, I think it's the idea of understanding why we feel the way that we feel. And, and to expand on that, you know, Quite often, I think many of us respond sort of instantaneously to different triggers. You know, an event might happen or somebody might say something to us and it potentially kind of rubs you the wrong way. And we have this immediate emotional response to that. And, and oftentimes, like if you were to ask somebody, well, what happened here? It would be, well, so-and-so said this and made me angry. And, and in fact, the distance between the person saying whatever it is that they have said and you know me being angry about that is a much larger distance than we probably give it credit for and in between that is a thought um, and that thought could be this reminds me of some other time where I was slighted in the past and because of that I am actually angry so emotional intelligence is really about being able to slow down that sort of event, thought, emotion um, sequence, and, and then ultimately how we respond to that. So, um, you know, if you've ever had the experience of responding kind of harshly right in the heat of the moment and then later regretting that, saying, oh, gee, I wish I had responded differently or in a more positive manner, um, you know, emotional intelligence, strengthening your emotional intelligence skill um, would allow you to, um, to be able to navigate those types of, you know, triggers in our environment. So this sounds interesting because if I think event, emotion, very short distance, 
I mean, I think that happens to me all the time, Tracy. Something happens and straight away there's an emotion. Is, is it just me or is that how we humans are? <laughs> I would say you are, are in great company. It happens to me. It happens to all of us. And it most definitely is a skill set. Um, you know, one of the benefits of coaching is to become, you know, more aware of ourselves and in you know emotional intelligence is a great example of that so so you're definitely not alone and i would say it's a skill set that we could all benefit from so there's an event that happens and then you know there's an emotion i i recognize that something happens and straight away that there's an emotion that arises um in me um so how how do i go from that to slowing down and and identify and you said there's a thought in the middle which which for, for an awful lot of us you know we just don't see it because we go from event to motion so i like that analogy so how how do i go from that instant instinct jump you know fight or flight into okay you know there's a thought in the middle and let's let's spend some time thinking about the thought right and so learning how to do learning how to do exactly that will change your life i promise you it is an amazing skill set and, and the first is it, the first step really is being able to recognize that this process is going on. And, it, and so I often will tell my clients, I'll say, okay, the first step is to stop and just take a breath and think about what, what just happened in my immediate emotional response. Um, and, and then to ask ourselves this question, you know, what is really going on here? You know, is it truly this situation or is it something about this that reminds me of something else I still have sort of unfinished emotion related to? Once you're able to navigate that and, and kind of slow down, analyze, you know, what's really happening here, then you can choose, okay, how do I really want to respond in this situation? And um, so I'll encourage clients to think about, you know, what would my, the best version of me, how would the best version of me respond in this situation? What if my loved ones or my children were nearby, how would I respond? And, you know, it, it can seem a little artificial uh, to start with until, um, until we gain a little bit of experience with, with going through this process. And then after the fact, you know, one of the benefits is you, you respond more professionally, probably with less emotional charge. Um, and then we also don't regret what we say later. <laughs> so I, I think we could all relate to, you know, having um, having the thought that, gee, I wish I could rewind, you know, to 10 minutes ago and do that a little bit differently. I think the challenge is that, that maybe if you if you're capable of slowing yourself down, and sort of saying, okay, you know, there's something's happened, then there's an emotion, and you slow down and look at the thought, and then you consciously choose what kind of a person you're going to want to be. Um, that, that you know, that that sounds that sounds good. I think the challenge, I wonder, maybe for me or for a lot of people, is is the slowing down. You know, sort of how because I don't know, there's something very. I mean, why why is that? Why are we as humans like that? That something happens and bang straight away, there's an emotion that that happened. You know, why why are we like that? And where does that where does that come from yeah. yeah that's a great question and you know my belief on that is that at, at some point in our past usually when we're kids you know we have learned a lesson or experienced experienced something in which that was the response which got us through that moment and unfortunately our brains just kind of take those lessons from childhood and bring them forward and, and start to, um, you know, use them a little bit inappropriately. <laughs> and, and so I, I think it's in many ways, it's a protective mechanism gone awry, um, you know, from something that we learned as kids and, and said, okay, well, in this situation, this, this was how I, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, survived the situation. And, and now that I'm an adult, um, it, you know, I haven't changed that because it worked previously. So, so for sure, I think it's, um, it, it, unless we become aware of kind of that loop thinking, um, it can be hard to break. And, and so part of that is becoming aware, where does this thought come from? Yeah. Um, so maybe it's a habit that perhaps was useful to us 
you know, in a playground, but actually when it comes to, you know, your, your office meeting, your professional or your multidisciplinary meeting, that then actually, you know, it's not something that's useful. But it does happen all the time because, you know, as, as I sort of say, certainly I'm, I'm sure that I do that a lot. And I certainly have colleagues around me um, that, that, that do that a lot. Um, the, the, I mean, how, 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 how much can people improve? You know, is this something that, you know, you either are emotionally intelligent and you're not, and some people are just born luckier than others? You know, how, how much of this can we learn and train versus how much of this is, is just, you just either have it or you don't have it? Oh, I would definitely say the former. Uh, certainly there are some people which have strengths in emotional, like inherent strengths in emotional intelligence, but it is definitely a skill set which can be learned if one is open to learning about themselves and becoming more self-aware. And, and there are a number of ways that one can actually do that, um, you know, skill sets that can be strengthened, which would help in the context of emotional intelligence as well as, you know, other, uh, other things in our lives. I, I want to just pause too and, and say I like the summary of the um, habits and skill sets that we learned on the playground and applying those to you know our professional interactions. It's it's a great um, visual of of how sometimes things can go a little awry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the you said that um, it's a skill set that we can learn or we can become more self aware. So how how does one become more self aware? Yeah, you know, there's a, a number of different um, modalities to become sort of more self-aware. And sometimes that can be after the fact. So um, for somebody who's, you know, just starting out learning about emotional intelligence, and maybe it, that's not one of their personal strengths, um, you know, after sort of an event that didn't go so well, um, there's a lot of utility to just taking some time to think about that, to maybe perhaps journal about that, and to really um, practice the the skill set of of sort of trading places with that individual, um, and and so that will help develop uh, empathy um, as a skill set. So you know uh, that's one place to start. Um, you know the next place, of course, is learning to. Uh, really regulate or self-regulate our emotions and you know that as I said you know taking a deep breath and taking time to really think before we respond um, can be helpful um, helpful as well to help uh, sorry to help develop that skill set so there's some actions there that we can do as in we take a breath we reflect you know, we, we, we pause, we think, so there's actions that we take and through taking those actions, then we learn about ourselves. And then that means that, that we become more self-aware and we get better at, at how we handle the emotions, that, that the strong emotions that come up that otherwise might just whisk, whisk us away, sort of in a direction where actually we probably wouldn't want to be going had we thought about it for any length of time. Yeah. It, exactly. It's really kind of twofold. So there's that first part, that building awareness. Yeah. And, you know, so we become, you know, developing that skill set in and of itself is useful because we can start to step out of ourselves and really take a look and examine our own thought process, you know, in the moment that, you know, the second part of that is learning, okay, well, now how do I respond? Yeah. And, um, you know, um, a positive manner, um, something that's going to be appropriate, you know, for the situation. And so there are additional sort of soft skills, things like learning how to uh, resolve conflict and, you know, learning to more effectively communicate. Um, and also, I think just this um, sort of understanding a different point of view. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those those three sort of general soft skills um, are helpful, I think, for the second part of now, how do I respond, given that I recognize I'm being triggered, uh, you know, in, in, the, in this situation. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, we started talking about that emotional intelligence is about how you relate to yourself 
and how you relate to others. And I was going to I was going to pick up the relating to others separately, but it sounds like we've already talked quite a lot about the link between how I relate to myself and my self perception, self insight. Then there's a very clear link between that and then how I relate to others. Is there anything else that we need to say about emotional intelligence as, as how we relate to others? Well, I think that, like you, as you just nicely stated, I, I think practicing the skill set of becoming aware of oneself and then also um, strengthening our ability to empathize with others, it's a sort of natural extension of that same, same skill set. And so what we learn to apply to ourselves, we can then easily apply to others. And I would say probably the, the more important thing initially in um, developing this skill set is understanding ourselves and our how we feel, why we feel, mm -hmm. and, and sort of what's going on there on a deeper level. And at that point, it becomes much easier to take that same thought process and apply it to somebody else who perhaps is act acting, you know, more brash or a, a little bit in the moment um, and uh, allowing them some grace and and not allowing someone else's behavior to to trigger us uh, again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested if I have if I see something in the workplace, you know, when somebody is very much behaving with that very quick something happens and there's an emotion and an action follows and I notice that and let's sort of say that you know maybe I am emotional intelligence enough so that I don't get triggered but how, how do I how do I as a colleague help somebody in the work who, who does that a lot right well it, it's it all comes down to awareness and so you know first of all a, a colleague has to have an open mind to, to maybe some personal self-growth mm -hmm. and, you know, a, approaching somebody um, when it's not in the heat of the moment is probably a better opportunity to invoke a little bit of self-awareness there. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, when I speak with clients, I'll, it, that we talk about this uh, situation, um, first of all, find an appropriate time you know, to bring it up and to bring it up in a way that's non-judgmental. Um, you know, here's something that I have learned that helps me uh, respond to situations similar to what just occurred, for instance. And, um, you know, I mean, we all <laughs> we all worked with one another and the more emotionally intelligent we are collectively, the better we work together, the happier um, and more constructive our days are. Um, so it, it's certainly a great skill set um, to share with one another, to teach one another. Um, but like I said, it all has to start with somebody being open to the possibility of learning about it. Mm -hmm. um, and just talk a little bit more about you know the benefits of it. So, um, and I guess a question whether I have it. So how, how do I know whether I am emotional intelligence or not as the case may be yeah it's uh, well that's a really great question i i think the um you know as we were discussing earlier you know when we have an example of something that happens that's kind of triggering to us you know do we recognize in ourselves our ability to respond to that in a positive constructive way or are we allowing that emotion to kind of carry us away in in and take an action that maybe we regret later. And so I, I would say the one way to think about that is, you know, how frequently does that happen um, on a given week? Because, you know, we're human. <laughs> it's it's not always going to be maybe 100% of the time that we're going to respond in a way that we want to, but certainly you can see um, the trend. And so if in, on any given week, this is happening on a daily basis where, I feel wronged and I'm angry and I say something I regret later, you know, versus maybe it only happens once a week or maybe it only happens, you know, once every few weeks. So, so that's one way to think about, you know, how to measure how you're doing. I hope you're enjoying the show. Please click subscribe so you'll be notified when new episodes become available. This podcast is part of my mission to help doctors create successful and meaningful careers. You can be part of that mission too by forwarding this show to one person who you think might benefit from listening. Thank you. Now on with the show.
And what are the benefits of being emotionally intelligent to, to me personally? Yeah, well, the benefits really, um, you know, so, so my interest is in creating greater happiness in our lives. And uh, so I would say, I would argue that that's one of, I mean, in addition to the professional benefits, and certainly, you know, if you're at work, you don't want to say something that gets you in trouble at work. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in the long run, when we are able to think about a situation and react in a more positive manner, that translates to greater fulfillment in our day. Mm -hmm. and, and that ultimately leads to greater happiness in our work life um, and, and our professional life as well. You know, being a physician is, um, can be a very stressful environment. We deal with um, very challenging situations, sometimes, you know, on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis or even more. And, it, you know, being able to sort of discharge of those emotions that are not helping us will allow us at the end of the day to feel better about ourselves and to not carry that negative emotion with us. And I would argue that that is going to lead to, you know, a happier existence in the field of medicine. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested in this idea that, that what we do with those negative emotions, because I guess, so I now have this vision of, you know, there's a barrier. I don't allow any negativity to come into my life. I live in a sort of happy, positive bubble or or I'm kind of thinking, you know, there's all of this negativity and I just absorb it and I'm like a sponge and there's an endless supply of sponge into which I can just absorb that. So where's the where's the balance between between I don't know, between absorbing those negative things or managing them and because, you know, emotionally, with emotional intelligence, we talk about it, it, it's about making choices and understanding rather than about absorbing or, or, or blocking, I think. Is that, my, is that my understanding correct? Absolutely. I, yes, I'm glad that you made that distinction because, you know, employing um, emotional intelligence skills does not mean blocking out the emotion. It's, it, it's very, um, very much managing that emotion. So, you know, it's okay that somebody has said something and I'm angry about that. Um, you know, I'm human. It's I get angry. That's a normal, uh, normal emotion. But what I do with that is what's important there. And, and so, you know, for the individual that is constantly, um, you know, frustrated and angry and in absorbing, you know, as you said, like a sponge, these you know, negative emotions throughout the day. You know, this sticks with us. This has, you know, implications for our health and our mental well-being, even our, our physical well-being. Um, and, and it can lead to um, compensatory behaviors, things like buffering, things like, you know, overeating or watching too much TV or partaking in, you know, gambling or other behaviors that are not sort of helpful um, as a way to cope with all of that negative energy. So, um mm -hmm. rather than absorbing all of this energy and carrying it around with us you know all day every day weeks on end um if we're able to sort of discharge that and manage those negative emotions which are going to come up mm -hmm. um you know from time to time uh overall it's going to improve our health improve our mental well-being and our you know basic existence it will improve our our home life with our you know families Mm -hmm. yeah. So I like that. So so it's not, it doesn't mean absorbing all of the negativity. It doesn't mean putting a barriers sort of to keep negativity out. It's about, you know, that, that there are, that their emotions exist. And, and I guess, you know, that those emotions that that's giving us information. It's telling us something about ourselves. It's, it tells us what kind of person you are. It tells us what's important to us. Um, and then, then you know, we make choices with with that information, and you know, we we do we do what we want to do. So sort of we're not ruled by them. We don't block them. We don't absorb them. And it's about well, this is information that tells us something about ourselves or the world. And then and then it's 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 consciously making the decisions. And that is that consciously making the decision about what I do with it. That's that seems very powerful, doesn't it? I'm not being ruled by my emotions. You know, I'm not I'm not sort of you know being 
thrown about in the wind of emotions. You know, I, they, 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 there's these emotions, they tell me something and, you know, and I'm consciously deciding what I do with that because that sounds like a very powerful position to be in. Absolutely. You know, so oftentimes we are triggered around the idea that we think the world should be different, that people should be different or that, you know, somebody ought to recognize that this is how I want things done. And it, it's this, it, it's almost um, it, egotistical kind of in the way in that we expect the world really to bend to, to what we want it to be. And, and that's just a way to set us up for disappointment, right? So it's, it's much better to think in terms of, you know, um, I desire this to be, um, the, this person to treat me in this way. And they still might not, um, but rather than being angry, um, you know, and saying that they should treat me in such and such manner, if I think about that in terms of, I desire them to treat me in, you know, a respectful way that if they don't, then I'm left disappointed and being disappointed is actually better than being angry um, in the long, you know, in the grand scheme of things. And, and so, you know, kind of pairing that thought process with emotional intelligence helps gives us a little bit greater insight, both into our own behaviors and thoughts and feelings, as well as others um, thoughts and feelings. Can we talk a bit more about sort of this, this should, because, you know, that happens a lot in my head. The world should be this way. This meeting should be run in a certain way. We should be working, you know, that that exists in my head all the time. But also in some of the discussions that, that I have with people around me, you know, that 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 often comes up. And actually, you know, exactly the example that you, that you say is, well, this is how I am. And, you know, they they should be in a certain way that accommodates me. Um, and, you know, that that story that people have, you know, this is how I am and the rest of the world should be in a certain way to accommodate me that, you know, that that's very problematic, isn't it? So, I mean, why I wonder why, why do we think like that? Why do we think that the world should be how I think the world should be? Because I think we all do that. Please tell me, Tracy, we all do that. It's not just what plays in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you are in good company. I do that as well. And, you know, in some circles, we talk about that as this idea of the manual, you know, so everybody has their own book of rules about how the world should work and how people should do this, that and the other thing. And and, and then, of course, we're, we're, you know, disappointed or angry or frustrated when people don't read our rules. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, oh, People don't know <laughs> what it is that that are what our expectations are, and you know. So part of that comes down to communicating. Um, you know, this this is my expectation, so that we have an agreement of of what we both want from a given situation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think too that. Um, uh oh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in how th that agreement, because the reality is, you know, if I think for, for myself and the people around me, you know, that conversation about how the world should be, um, I mean, I don't think I've ever had a conversation with anybody around how I think the world should be and how you think the world should be. I mean, maybe sort of, you know, if there's projects and perhaps sort of, you know, you negotiate, don't you sort of, if you say, okay, you know, how, how, how are we going to do day case tonsillectomy and, you know, and then sort of, that, but, you know, but I probably, well, I probably do have a view of how day case tonsillectomy should be, but perhaps I know that, that that's not my world because, you know, there's a patient and there's many, many of us around that patient and maybe the way that I rationalize that is, well, it's not my world, it's the patient's world. So, you know, so it's not me being in my world, it's about the patient. So we all come around the patient and then I tell you how my world should be and the anesthetist says how their world should be and the pre-assessment nurse says how their world should be. And then somewhere around the patient, we negotiate something about how the patient's world should be. And, you know, that kind of, that seems quite... Quite, I think that's quite easy because we can probably all agree that sort of that that, that we're gonna, or hopefully most of us can agree that that we're there for the patient and we negotiate that. But I'm wondering maybe sort of some of our professional meetings or business meetings. You know, have I have I ever sort of sat down with my consultant colleague and says, well, this is this is how I think the world should be, and they sort of said, well, this is how I think the world should be. Um, I'm not sure that we have Tracy. 
So it's quite difficult, I think, to do that, isn't it? To to have that discussion, probably because we all assume that everybody agrees with us. Is that is that <laughs> what you do? Yeah. exactly that that is the key is that for most of us we assume everybody agrees with our point of view yeah. and you know as soon as i say you know the world should be this way this meeting should have ended 10 minutes ago whatever um you know i am giving up sort of my happiness in that moment to something i have no control over and you know it, as soon as we start sort of um basing our our happiness on things that are beyond our control we set ourselves up for for failure in that situation and, and it's this idea the world should be this way um or that person ought to have known that this was going to make me angry and it, it's it invokes a kind of uh mind reading skill that the world should be um privy to my internal thoughts and automatically understand that um so if i'm not able to communicate that this is how i want my clinic set up or you know well whatever the example might be um it, at least getting that out there this is the expectation that i have this is how i would like it then there is no sort of um guesswork on the part of you know your colleague in the clinic, um, you know, helping you to get ready for your day, for example. Yeah. And as, as we discuss it, it kind of it's, you know, it sounds hilarious that we think and I assume that you know how my how the world should be, because of course, it's, it's hilarious. But the reality is that in the real world, I, I think that's what we do, isn't it? We just, we just assume <laughs> that everybody knows how, what we're thinking, um, and what we want, or, or I think I think sort of that, that happens a lot. Yeah. Well, I agree. I think that makes sense because, you know, we each have our own reasoning and thought process about how the world is as we see it. And, it, you know, I, I liken this to the idea of, um, you know, wearing rose colored glasses. So when I see the world through rose colored glasses, of course, everything looks rosy. Um, but, you know, not everybody has that same pair of glasses. Some people are wearing blue colored glasses or green colored glasses. And to them, the world is very real and very different from my perspective. And, you know, so circling back to um, sort of the the empathy portion of emotional intelligence it's it's that understanding that we all see the world from a very different point of view um, and to each of us it makes sense but it doesn't necessarily overlap 100 percent with the next person you know to your right mm -hmm. i'm wondering now would would the world be better if everybody saw the world like I do or you know what what are the advantages of the fact that everybody sees the world differently to how I see the world well I think you know it's our we are completely blind to our own blind spots right and so if everybody saw the world in the exact same manner we would probably be missing out on some pretty cool things in the world and you know so bringing that diverse uh, viewpoint to to work to our personal lives I think makes our lives more more full if we are open to seeing the world from somebody else's perspective and understanding what that means and it may actually change our perspective of what we think mm -hmm. i'm interested in imagining a workplace full of people that are not emotional intelligence and then imagining a workplace full of people that are can you sort of paint, paint me a picture of you know of of a of a clinic full of people that lack emotional intelligence and then full of people that have emotional intelligence. Ooh, well, I think I've worked in both situations. <laughs> <laughs> to be easy, then. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it, you know, so in a workplace where less people are skilled in emotional intelligence, I would say there's a great deal more conflict, more tension. You know, people are less happy, more anxious. Uh, with their work and you know in a physician setting you know in a doctor setting that can translate to poor patient outcome um, you know if we're not effectively communicating and, and helping one another and working in a productive manner in a, mm -hmm. a clinic so so there's you know it's it's more benefit than just ourselves and the people that we're interacting with, it can actually translate to worse patient outcomes. Now to contrast that with a clinic setting where everybody is highly emotionally intelligent, um, 
you know, one of the long, one of the overall benefits of that is that patient outcomes are going to be better. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that people are able to interact with one another. Um, you know, the the physicians and the staff are able to interact in a productive um, manner without a lot of misunderstandings. Or if there are misunderstandings, they're able to um, deal with those appropriately and quickly. So we have less, less stress, less anxiety, less tension, um, and less sort of emotional knee jerk reactions, um, you know, in perhaps, you know, critical situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I can bring us to a close, I'm interested in what would be what would be your top tips for physicians when it comes to emotional intelligence? Yeah, I think, you know, just to, to start with becoming aware of our own thoughts and feelings. And the best way to do that is to really spend some time getting to know, you know, our feelings. And, and that may stem from, um, you know, sort of analyzing or thinking about an interaction that you wish after the fact had gone differently. Um, you know, practicing that skill set will help bring that awareness closer to the point of that um of that trigger actually happening and and once we gain awareness at that point working on our skill sets um you know our soft skills like conflict management and good communication and good listening skills um so we can pair our awareness with an appropriate reaction um even when things aren't going our way wonderful thank you very much tracy Thank you. This has been really fun. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me.